Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kadrowski and this organic chemistry video covers addition of HX to alkenes. This is called hydrohalogenation and the video also covers Markovnikov's rule. This slide will cover an overview of hydrohalogenation reactions. This is a reaction between an alkene and HX where X is equal to chlorine or bromine. Here I've drawn a generalized alkene where we're not really talking about any specific substituents on the alkene. We'll get into that later. The hydrohalogenation reaction is a two-step mechanism, and the first step is rate limiting. Protonation of the double bond occurs in step one to give a carbocation intermediate. The electrons in the carbon-carbon double bond are attracted to the strong acid proton here on HX, and they'll go out and make a bond to it. This is an acid-base reaction. The result is a carbocation intermediate, where here I've shown in color the H that came from the acid and the carbocation carbon is shown there. In the next step, X minus attacks the carbocation and there are two possible faces of the carbocation. It could come in either from the face that the H was added from or it could come in from the opposite face. First, let's take a look at the top face attack. The nucleophile comes in and attacks there. The product is what's called syn addition, where the X and the H were added from the same face of the double bond. The other possibility though is that X minus might attack from the opposite face, from the bottom face. In that case, the product would be anti-addition, where the two groups were added from different faces of the double bond. Both products are possible in the hydrohalogenation reaction, and you'll get both. This slide will cover the hydrohalogenation reaction mechanism and talk about some energy changes. Here we've got an energy level diagram where there's energy shown on the y-axis with units of kilojoules per mole. And on the x-axis, we have reaction coordinate, which is just the passing of time. I'll start with the reactants here, the alkene and the HX reagent, and I can represent their energy by drawing a line on the energy level diagram. As the first step happens, we get to the intermediate carbocation in X minus, and I'll draw a line on the energy level diagram to indicate the stability of those two species. And it's much higher in energy because carbocations are pretty unstable. This line shows the energy progression of the reaction from reactants onto intermediates, and notice there's a peak up here. That's the transition state for the first step. I can extend a line out from the starting material energy and then draw a line to measure the distance between the starting point and the highest point on the graph, the transition state. That is E sub A1, which is the activation energy of the first reaction step. That's how much energy we have to invest or put in to get the reaction to go. The next step involves the nucleophile attacking the carbocation, and that can occur from two different faces to give the two possible products, the syn addition and the anti addition. I'll describe their energies with the line on the energy level diagram down here. And similarly, we can sketch a line to show the transition from intermediates to products. We can also extend a red dotted line here and measure the distance between the carbocation intermediates and the height of the second hump, which is the transition state for the second reaction. The height of that energy barrier is E sub A2. That's the activation energy of the second step. Between these two steps, the first step has by far the higher activation energy, so that's the rate determining step in the overall process. The rate of the overall process just depends on this first step, the formation of the carbocation, and then the second step here is fast. The other thing we can do is look at the energy difference between reactants and products. So I'll sketch a dotted line out here from the products and we'll measure the difference in energy from starting materials to products. That's delta G for the reaction, the overall energy change. The products are lower in energy than the starting materials, so delta G is negative. This is a reaction that would favor products. Reactions like to go from higher in energy to lower in energy. And when delta G is negative like this, products would be favored. The next slide, I'll cover some of the reasons delta G is negative for hydrohalogen reactions. On this slide we've got an example of a hydrohalogenation reaction between cyclohexene and HX where X could be CL or BR. The energy changes in that reaction are governed by this equation. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Delta G is the overall change in energy. Delta H is the enthalpy change or the heat part of energy. And then minus T, T is temperature, and delta S is change in entropy. That's disorder. So we'll look at each one of these terms in the equation and decide whether it favors products or not. Does it make delta G more negative or more positive? First, we'll take an inventory of the bonds that are broken and formed. If we look at the bonds broken in this reaction, we have two bonds that are breaking. They're highlighted here in yellow. There's one sigma bond, which is a stronger type bond, and then we have one pi bond, which is weaker. 
If we compare that to the bonds that are formed in the process, we've got two highlighted bonds here, which are both sigma bonds, so these are strong. Overall then, the bonds are stronger in the products than they are in the reactants in addition reactions. That makes delta H enthalpy change negative. Hydrohalogenation reactions are exothermic reactions because the bonds that are formed are stronger than the bonds that are broken, and the difference comes out as heat. Exothermic reactions tend to favor products because delta H being negative tends to make delta G negative. But the other term in the equation is the entropy term, the delta S, so we'll need to look at that one as well. Entropy or disorder decreases in hydrohalogenation reactions, and the reason for that is two reactants are becoming one product. So this is a net decrease in disorder because there's less freedom of motion in the products. So entropy or the delta S term is negative, and that helps make delta G positive, which tends to favor for reactants. Delta S being negative gets multiplied by a negative T term and the net effect is to make delta G more positive and that tends to favor reactants. So the delta H and the delta S term are conflicted in this case. They don't agree on delta G. The important thing that will determine which term wins out is the T component because the effect of delta S is temperature dependent. Near room temperature, the effect of entropy on delta G term is small. Therefore, near room temperature, delta G is negative and products are favored because the entropy term just isn't as important. Addition reactions tend to be favored near room temperature. On this slide, we'll talk about Markovnikov's rule. Markovnikov's rule says that in addition reactions that involve a carbocation, the more stable of two possible carbocation intermediates forms selectively. This leads to a more highly substituted of two possible addition products. In this example, we'll take a look at this reaction of this differentially substituted alkene, this 1-methylcyclohexene. When it reacts with a strong acid, HCl, it gets protonated, and one possibility would be to protonate this double bond on the less substituted carbon, which would be up here, which would give a carbocation on the more substituted carbon. That is a tertiary carbocation. The other possibility is that when the protonation happens, the proton might go on the more substituted carbon, and that would give a carbocation on the other carbon. That possibility is shown here and is a secondary carbocation. So when a double bond gets protonated, the proton goes on one of the carbons and the carbocation goes on the other. Markovnikov's rule says that the more highly substituted carbocation is favored because they're more stable. The secondary carbocation here isn't going to form simply because it's a lot less stable than the tertiary carbocation. So this will be the major carbocation and that's going to lead to the major product. The nucleophile then will attack that carbocation, chloride attacks the tertiary carbocation, and that leads to a product where the chlorine is in the more highly substituted position. Chlorine is attached to the more substituted of the two carbons of the alkene. When you're thinking about Markovnikov's rule, I think it's valuable to draw the carbocation intermediate and then just think about the stability of the two possible carbocations, and then just realize that the more substituted carbocation wins. That's Markovnikov's rule summarized. When a carbocation forms in a hydrohalogenation reaction, it might rearrange to become more stable. This is true of all carbocations, and we're going through a carbocation intermediate in this reaction. Here's an example that shows how this can happen. We've got an alkene here that reacts with HBr, and the first step, we protonate the alkene to put the carbocation in the more stable of the two possible positions. This is a secondary carbocation, which is more stable than the other alternative, which would have been a primary carbocation. So in this case, we get the more stable of the two possible carbocations. And Br- might attack that, and that could give an alkyl bromide product, which has a new stereogenic center here, and it would form as a mixture of stereoisomers. There'd be an R version and an S version. So that's one set of products. When you form a carbocation, you need to think about if it's possible for it to rearrange to become more stable. And in this case, it could. If this proton here were to move over with a pair of electrons, as indicated with this blue arrow, that would be a 1,2 hydride shift. And that would produce a new carbocation that's a tertiary carbocation. And those are more stable. So since this is a possibility that is available for the initial carbocation, it's going to prefer to rearrange to become more stable and form that tertiary carbocation. Then the Br- can attack that carbocation cation, and that leads to an alkyl bromide product that looks like this. The major product here is going to be the rearranged product. A good rule of thumb in dealing with reactions of carbocations is to think if they could rearrange to become more stable, they probably will, and that'll lead to the major product. 
Let's go through some practice problems just to get some more experience with these reactions. We'll do the top one first, in which we have an alkene reacting with HCl. In the first step, HCl protonates the double bond, and that leads to a carbocation intermediate, shown here. We have two possible positions for the carbocation. The carbocation could either go on the less substituted or the more substituted carbon, but based on Markovnikov's rule, the more substituted carbocation is far more likely, and that's the one that forms preferentially. Then in the next step, Cl- can attack that carbocation, and it can attack it from two possible faces. There's the top face, which would give it a wedged bond orientation, and there's a bottom face, which would give it a dash bond orientation, and we get both. Here's the product where the chlorine came in from the bottom face approach and gets a dashed bond. Here's the situation where the chlorine came in from the top face and gets a wedge type bond. It's a good idea when you have a reaction of a carbocation to think about the nucleophile attacking from both of the two possible faces. Sometimes that gives two different stereoisomer products, sometimes it doesn't, but but it's always a good idea to check to make sure. Now we'll move on to the lower example where we have an alkene reacting with HBr, and the first step in that process is the alkene gets protonated. Now here there are two identical carbons. The alkene is symmetrical, and it doesn't matter which carbon gets the proton, they'll give two identical carbocations. Now that's a secondary carbocation, so you have to ask yourself, could that rearrange to become more stable? There's a proton next door here that I've drawn in that could potentially move over in a 1,2 hydride shift to generate a new carbocation, which is now tertiary and more stable. So this is one of those situations where carbocation forms initially, but can rearrange range to become more stable and that's going to lead to the major product. Br- will attack that major carbocation and that'll give this alkyl bromide as the major product. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video. And consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.